Hello everyone, I wanted to talk through the forecasting tab that we've got now in our JB Hi-Fi spreadsheet. Um, I've updated this slightly since the one that was um, initially posted just to hopefully give a little bit more structure and clarity. Let's look at the forecasting assumptions first, running through one by one. The first thing we need, and that's always going to be our, what usually will be our starting point for a forecasting task, is revenue. The revenue forecast that you can see that I have here, these are based on what I've got in the sales growth tab. So if we look at the sales growth tab, um, you'll see how I've set up the JB Hi-Fi spreadsheet. I've, I've forecast separately out for JB Hi-Fi Australia, JB Hi-Fi New Zealand, and the good guys. Um, forecasting out both the physical store sales, the number of stores, and the online sales. And that's getting us our revenue forecasts. So revenue forecasts are taken from that previous tab. The next set of forecasts, I'm now forecasting the operating profit margins. Now the profit margin forecasts are going to be based on your assessment of the, uh, the industry conditions as well as your firm strategy and the extent to which margins are likely to change or not. The next two forecasts that I have and that I've got in row seven and row eight, this is our turnover ratio. So instead of sales over assets or sales over a component of assets, I've just flipped it. So it's assets divided by sales. The reason that I do that is that I'm now thinking about this in terms of what percentage of sales is the firm going to need in both short term or operating working capital? And what percentage of sales does the firm require in long term assets to generate those sales. So just thinking about it as a percentage, but it's directly and it's inversely related to the sales turnover that, um, that we've previously been thinking about. Again, I'm thinking about to what extent is the need for working capital likely to change and to what extent is the operating, sorry, the long-term operating assets likely to change. You see, for example, I forecast a slight decline from recent years in terms of JB Hi-Fi. That's because I'm anticipating an increase in the proportion of online sales relative to physical store sales. So that's going to require less investment in things like the stores. So there'll be lower assets on the balance sheet for each dollar of sales. We then have our after-tax cost of debt. This can be a tricky one to forecast because uh, even the professionals find it difficult to forecast movements in interest rates. Then finally, we've got our start of year debt to capital. So this is our leverage. So net debt divided by net debt plus equity, the debt to capital ratio. So again, we're thinking about how's capital structure likely to change couple of things that's worth noting. First, what I've got highlighted here in these two cells. Um, the balance sheets that we have below are start of year. And we need start of year balance sheets because that's going to make our, our valuation task a little bit easier. You could use end of year balance sheet and you just need to sh shift columns around a year. But importantly, I've got start of year. So the start of year for 2023 is the end of year for 2022. So the start of year balance sheet already exists for JB Hi-Fi because they've already reported their 2022 financial uh, results. So these numbers are taken from the balance sheet. Okay, so I'm not forecasting those. This also means that for our uh, start of year working capital, start of year long-term assets divided by sales, it's the balance sheet components, so the working capital and long-term assets respectively, they already exist. It's the sales that is the forecast. So that's why I've shaded that in a slightly different color. Last thing I'm going to note is that I'm forecasting a terminal year. So I've got one, two, three, four year or five years of detailed forecast where my fifth year is my terminal year. I also need to do a sixth year because when I go down, when we drop down and see the cash flow forecast, to estimate our free cash flows, I'm going to need end of year balance sheet because I need to know how the balance sheet evolves over that final year. So to do that, I need final year sales or the 2028 sales to generate end of 2027 or start of 2028 balance sheet. These forecasts in 2028 must be the same as the 2027 because I'm assuming that from 2027 on, 
all of these ratios stay the same indefinitely or forever because that's the way our valuation models work. So the final year that I've got is 2028 must be the same as 2027. Uh, the start anything with a start of year balance sheet in 2023 that already exists because I've already got the 2022 financial statements and balance sheet. Okay. This set of forecasts that I now have in rows five through 10 is going to be sufficient for us to generate a condensed balance sheet and a condensed income statement. And from that, we will get a condensed cash flow statement. So let's see first up. The beginning of year working capital, the end of the previous year working capital. So for the first few years, this is based off actual reported numbers. This is what we uh, calculated based in our, our balance sheet and our variables. I'm then going to be, um, uh, again, carefully noting that the forecast, what is under the forecast tab for 2023, is an actual because it's the actual end of year 2022. Okay, how do I get these numbers? So I'm now saying that my beginning of year working capital is a function of sales. So it's going to be 4.5. Uh, sorry, 0%, I'm assuming here 0%, 0% of 2024 sales. Okay, so that's going to be zero, I'm assuming that working cap is zero because that's kind of staying, bouncing around zero. It makes more sense to have a look at row eight. So I'm assuming that the start of year long-term assets needs to be 16% of forecast sales. So in other words, I'm saying that for each dollar of sales that I expect to generate, I need... 16 cents worth of long-term assets in place at the start of the year. So to get that, I'm going to say it's the 16% times the forecast sales figure that I've got is where I get my long-term assets. And I do that for each year. And so once I've got these forecast, I can then get these start of year balance sheet figures. I'm then adding those two together. So working cap plus long-term assets gives the net operating assets. So that's the resources that the business is going to use. I'm then going to be allocating those net assets across net debt and shareholders equity. And I do that based on my forecast capital structure or net debt to capital. So I've said here that I'm assuming that for JB Hi-Fi, net debt is gonna remain about a quarter of total capital. So this 1573 I'm going to be allocating 25% to net debt, 75% to shareholders equity. So we can see here, 25% of the forecast operating assets gets us our net debt figure. The remainder, so 75%, um, is going to be uh, the shareholders equity. And again, by construction, we need net capital to be the same as net operating assets because this is we've just pushed the balance sheet about. So the resources that we've got on an operating basis have to match the way in which they've been financed in terms of net debt and shareholders equity. So that's our balance sheet that we've got. Our final year balance sheet is, again, based on these terminal year forecast and the terminal year sales. So we don't actually need the terminal year income statement. We'll get to the income statement now. The income statement, sales, we're forecasting based on last year's sales along with sales growth. And we do that each year. Each year, the net operating profit after tax is going to be forecast sales by our net operating profit margin. And so that gets our net operating profit after tax. Our net interest expense after tax is going to be the amount of net debt that we have and our forecast after tax interest cost gets our net interest expense. So our net income is going to be the net operating profit less the net interest expense to get our net income. Now remember when we were working out net operating profit under our variables tab, we were adding back the interest expense because we started with net income. In this case, we're finishing with net income, so we want operating profit, less net interest expense to get our net income. And we do that for each of our forecasting years. We can then use those forecast to generate our cash flow forecast. And depending on whether we're interested in valuing the equity or the enterprise, we'll focus on free cash flow to equity holders 
or free cash flow to enterprise. We can generate both sets of figures based on what we already have here. Let's look at equity holders first. To calculate a measure of free cash flow to equity holders, we're going to start with net income. We're then going to work out what changed over the course of the year in terms of utilization of working capital. So we're now thinking about a free cash flow measure over 2023. So it's going to be the working capital that we had at the end of the year less the working capital at the start of the year. So that's why if we kind of look at the formula here, it's next year's start of year working capital less this year. So just be careful about which years you're picking up here. Again, it's the way we've set up using start of year or beginning of year balance sheets. Same thing for our long term assets. What was the change or the investment required in long term assets? This is remember, this is going to be a function of the extent to which we expect asset turnover to change, which is reflected in that start of year net operating assets relative to sales forecast. So if net operating asset turnover is going to change, that's going to be picked up here in, in the required capex. So again, just looking at the numbers here, I've got end of year operating long term operating assets less start of year long term operating assets. Finally, if we're thinking about what the shareholders are going to be entitled to, the equity holders, we need to account for any changes in net debt because the shareholders don't have a claim over any of the cash flows until the debt holders have been, been paid. So we're going to take into account changes in net debt. Now, in this case, net debt's gone down from the end of the year or from the start of the year to the end of the year. So that's going to result. So net debt's gone down. Let's think this through. That means that we have paid money back to the debt holder. So that's less money for the shareholders or the equity holders. That's why we see this 85 will be as a negative figure here yeah, because the, the net debt is going to be decreasing. Um, while I see that, uh, let me just get rid of a few decimal places there because that's going to be a bit, a bit nasty. So a subtraction because net debt's going down, that gets us our free cash flow to equity. So these are the figures that we're going to be using in our free cash flow valuation model. This 451.7 that we can see in the final year, that's going to be our terminal year free cash flow. Let's just scroll down slightly and we'll see how things work if we're looking at free cash flow to enterprise. And our free cash flow to enterprise or all financiers, rather than net income, we're looking at net operating profit because from the perspective of all capital providers, we want to exclude any financing costs or any, any net interest expense because that's really from the perspective of the debt holders, it's kind of left hand paying the right hand. So we want a measure of operating profitability rather than net income. So we need a measure of income excluding interest. Uh, and then we've still got our change in um, net operating assets again end of year less start of year or start of next year less uh, start of this year and we've also got the change in the long-term operating assets what we don't have that we had to equity holders is the change in net debt so we'll see we won't have a change in net debt again because we're looking at things from the perspective of the debt and the equity holders. So that's why the net cash flow to all capital providers or the net cash flow to or the free cash flow to enterprise is going to be slightly different than the free cash flow to equity. And again, we've got our terminal value here. What we'll see when we're looking at our valuation units is how we can utilize these free cash flows, how we can build them up into a valuation model that will be applicable to valuing the equity or the shares, and how we can value the enterprise or the awful operations of the firm. We'll think next week about why we might want to focus on one versus the other or where you're likely to see a focus on enterprise versus equity value. But that's the way we build up our, our forecast balance sheet, our forecast income statement, and from that derive the forecast cash flows.